I hit live in YouTube, so all quiet on the set. And I'm going to open the webinar and we're live. Welcome. Good evening, folks. We'll give it a moment and let everyone fill up the Zoom room. If I could get a confirmation from someone in the audience that they see my screen and hear me, that's always lovely. And welcome YouTube viewers. Hi, I didn't forget you. Tonight's event is being screened on YouTube. Thank you to our host for allowing that. And I just put a link in the box for tonight's uh, library news, as well as links to tonight's event. All right, a few more minutes. I mean, not a few more minutes, like one more minute and we're gonna get started. Perfect, all right. Welcome friends. And I wanna thank you all for being here tonight. I'm Anissa, your SFPL host and Thanks for joining us on a Friday night. I wanna do Friday, more Friday night events. So thank you for being here. Um, as I said, I put some, a chat link and anything that comes up tonight as the poets talk and books often come up, other resources, I'll throw those in that document. So there'll be lots of resources for you. We wanna welcome you to the unceded land of the Ohlone tribal people and acknowledge the many Ramutish Ohlone tribal groups and families as the rightful stewards on the lands on which we live and work here in the beautiful Bay Area. SFPL encourages you to learn more about first person culture and land rights and are committed to hosting events and providing all sorts of resources on these topics. And you can find that in that document that I shared. Um, another great thing about uh, my job, I love my job. I get to promote amazing people like tonight's tonight's folks, but we are not a neutral institution. We stand in solidarity with Black Lives Matter movement and particularly with the horrendous and violence acts that have been uh, going around for Asian and Asian Americans in our communities. And we really um, stand in solidarity and for our communities and our neighbors and our colleagues that are distressed by these attacks. We also wanna acknowledge that anti-Black and anti-Asian stereotypes and reporting of these acts of violence um, are intertangled and it is all white supremacy. And these uphold white supremacy and we're all harmed by this racism. And so these links I are in my, my chat box and you know it's important tonight. So thank you for being here and, and hearing all this and standing in solidarity with our community for sure. We are still in the pandemic, so as our libraries start to trickle open, we're doing it, it's happening. Um, please remember to wear those masks and, and protect all my family at the library and your family and all our families out there working in the streets. And now I'm just gonna breeze through some uh, great programs we have coming up virtually, birthday celebration with Jane Kim. If you've driven or walked down Hyde Street, you can't miss the monarch flying over. It's amazing joy. Um, April 28th, we'll have um, author Hanif Abdekweeb in conversation with actually Tongo, Isa Martin. There's a switch in combo. So Tongo, thank you. If you're out there, I really appreciate you coming in and being in combo with this amazing essayist, poet, critical uh, critique. So he's written a book, Little Devil in America. It is, I just started it. It's going to be good. So check it out at your library or purchase it from your local bookstore and show up. It's a partnership with the Museum of, Modern, uh, the Museum of African Diaspora. And a quick, we still are celebrating One City, One Book. Lots of um, programs with that. We've had two months of programs celebrating Chanel Miller and her book 
um, know my name. So check it out, it's still happening. Uh, Tuesday, we have the organization Mir Memoir who will be in the virtual library holding a virtual healing circle for survivors of childhood sexual assault. April is, child, is uh, Sexual Assault Awareness Month. So lots of resources in that document about this as well. And then we're heading right into May where we are uh, celebrating Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month. So many amazing programs, um, partnership with Kearney Street Workshop, celebrating poet Maria Lung. And all of these amazing poets are coming. So it's a friend launch party for her latest book. Come check that out. Um, if you're familiar with the graphic novel Tresse, now a Netflix option, our artist and writer will be in the virtual library on May 8th. And that's, I love this part of virtual land because they're joining us from Holland and the Philippines. So it really opens up what we get to do. Um, I am lots of things you can see, we're doing lots of things. So please come check us out. For May, our On the Same Page author, On the Same Page is a campaign we do to encourage all of San Francisco to read the same book at the same time. And then we have a book club and then we come together as a community and talk about the book. And we are celebrating author Vanessa Hua, who has several books out now, two for sure, and some short stories. And I just love the way she incorporates San Francisco in A River of Stars. Um, check it out and come to the talk. Chinatown Pretty, gotta come to that one. And you can see, oh, let's back up because there's Clara. Clara is also in tonight's event and Clara will be along with David Wong on May 27th for the Romance of Chinese, Chinese Poetry. Poetry and music, come check it out. All right, and now without further ado, I am going to turn it over to Kim Shuck, our seventh poet laureate. And we love Kim and I, Thank you for allowing me to be here and hold this space with you. Kim. Thank you, Anissa. I'm really grateful for the library, their solidarity with various communities and um, the way that they pulled together with us to help this, put this event together tonight. Um, I could wish that we were together for any other reason than the reason we're here tonight. But we do have to stand in solidarity with one another when things like this happen. As an indigenous woman, our communities suffer the loss of our women on a consistent basis. And uh, I know that it's sometimes really disheartening when we ask people to stand in solidarity with us and say things like, maybe it'd be better if they weren't killing you. And people basically respond by saying, I'm not sure we can go that far. Um, well, I, I will go that far. People need to not be shot for who they are. Um, and, uh, and I'm really grateful for all of the women who are reading tonight for different, a lot of different reasons. Most of the women who are reading for you tonight, I consider family. I've had them at my kitchen table. Um, there's a lot of love. And, um, and, and I've been pretty upset about what's been going on. And I'm, I'm not going to say a whole lot more about it, just that literally everybody here is a master of poetry. Literally everybody here is a master of poetry for in different ways, in all kinds of different ways. Um, I have sat with some of you and laughed until I couldn't breathe. That won't be tonight. I have cried with some of you and, um, and I just, uh, I'm grateful for the ability to try to hold space here. I have made a commitment to not be a bystander, to not be describable as a bystander in any of these circumstances. And uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tongo Eisen Martin to make his statement as well, our current and eighth Poet Laureate of San Francisco, Tongo. It's good to be with you all. 
have a statement. <laughs> uh, we are all contending with a white power structure who would not have any of us as human beings. And what the present moment is making clear is that there are no orbits of privilege. There are just two sides of a gun. Legacies of settler colonialism are still America's opiate of choice. Permanent war against we who will never be human to them. Um, an opiate. Now imagine your voice becoming equal to the aggregate of all power and all you have to do is mutter a racial epithet to achieve this godhood. Imagine the concentrated godhood of murdering non-white people. These times of hyper-individualism, hyper-militarization, ruling class worship, and pixelated second skin desensitization will only increase the enthusiasm of violence as culturally now, you are either a god or a nobody. None of us can any longer be anything except the protagonist of social transformation. What our histories of resistance show us is that we were never in all of these empires and never not in solidarity and familial cooperation shows us that solidarity is a three-dimensional practice internationalism a full immersion of mind body and spirit we protected each other we fed each other we trained each other provided each other sanctuary we provided each other with beautiful ideas about bringing true liberation to the total human journey. I stand in solidarity with my Asian siblings as they stand with all oppressed peoples. As truly, there's only one struggle for liberation. Much love to y'all. And now, what I'd like to do is um, essentially hand this over to um, Lauren Ito so that she can talk about the process and lead us through this reading. Lauren. Thank you so much, Kim. Um, such an honor to be joining folks today and thank you Tongo and Kim for grounding us in those words um, and reminding us that Yes, we are in solidarity and there is one struggle. Um, this today marks one month since the murder of, of eight folks, six of whom were Asian, Asian American women. And we ask that you just hold those folks in memory as um, we move through the space today. In terms of um, oftentimes folks will ask like, well, what can I do? How can I contribute? I wanna take action. And sometimes there's a question of how so we've compiled a few resources that will be shared in the chat in just a moment to support you in asking how to get involved and, and what that looks like from um, a sense of deepening into this practice together. And now I will pass it over to uh, Kim to uh, introduce our first poet and get into some amazing poetry with the folks who have um, all dedicated their time to reading and bringing the voice of poetry from many different pockets of the Bay uh, to share with us today. And I want to affirm that um, for everyone that's joined, this space is really for you and in service of you, and we welcome however you're showing up today. Thank you. Um, can you put the lineup in the chat, please, Lauren? I think our first reader if I remember correctly. I've got to say, this has not been a great moment in a lot of different directions. So my brain's a little bit scattered, but I believe our first reader tonight is Anouk. Yay. And um, I am really looking forward to hearing you. You are one of the two people I have not heard read yet. Um, <laughs> which leaves me with very little to say about your writing, <laughs> but I can't wait. Um, part of the part of the practice of poetry is to ensure and appreciate the fact that we need writers of a range of ages in every group so that we can have a lot of different voices. 
and I am really excited. So without further ado, Anok, please. Hi, yeah, thank you guys so much for having me. Um, hi, I'm Anuk. I am a 17 year old poet from Saratoga, California. So in the South Bay area, and I'm super um, glad to be able to share space with everyone today. Um, and today I will be reading two poems. And so this first poem is called Color Wheel Connotations. And it kind of speaks to um, kind of like the media aftermath um, of March 16th and how um, a lot of media outlets and um, Atlanta's police union chose to portray the entire event. And so it's called Color Wheel Connotations. My art teacher, Ever the Whimsic, tells me that colors are just complex emotions. Running her fingers along the edge of the color wheel, she says that colors convey emotions and that just like every good Taylor Swift lyric, depending on colors, inter interpretations may change. My art teacher floods her canvas with red, says red by itself is angry, but red drizzled with passion fruit orange is a glowing sunset smile. My art teacher says that depending on colors, interpretations may change, like how gold on purple is royalty in the middle ages, but gold on silver is San Francisco circa 1949, like how black and yellow is a bop, but black and blue is a bruise depending on colors, interpretations may change, like how black on white is classy, but black on black is ghetto, like how gun on white is patriot, but gun on color is terrorist, like how crime on white is sex addiction, but crime on color is still terrorist. Depending on colors, interpretations will change. So in the courtroom, when they arm up to paint with royal blues and subdued hues, I know they are painting an inherent eulogy. So in the courtroom, when they arm up to paint with pastels and white tinted pigments, I know they are painting a soft sentence where the canvas is the accused, the paintbrush, the judge's gavel, and the colors, the colors, the verdict, depending on colors, interpretations will change on the color wheel any sentence can be manipulated at the flick of a tongue. So yeah, that was the first poem. And this second poem is called um, On the Back Porch in response to Andrew Yang. And so I had originally written this poem, um, I think actually exactly a year ago um, in response to Andrew Yang's Washington Post op-ed, but I thought it was really resonant right now since I think recent events have really shown us that, you know, the model minority myth doesn't protect the Asian American community from anything. Um, so yeah, this is the poem. Um, on the back porch, in response to Andrew Yang's op-ed on the pandemic, after Samuel Getachew. We Asian Americans need to show and embrace our Americanness in ways we have never before. We should show that we are, without a shadow of doubt, Americans who will do our part for our country in this time of need. Andrew Yang. This is how it starts. We are propelled by the flame blooming in the underbelly of our sedulity, blown over from a land of white rice and honey, where patience is all 10 of the commandments on the tablet. When we arrive, they tell us their Moses doesn't recognize us. So we sit hopeful in cramped back alleyways, embracing our Americanness in ways we've never before, thriving off corner scraps and hand-me-downs, sitting at the back door, waiting for them to finally call us into the house, waiting for them to tell us that we are different, we are special, we, are the good ones. We sit there in the heat on our haunches, growing fat like ticks off of white lies and cut passports, lungs swelling with elusive euphemisms until our backs turn scarlet, wringing rose blistered hands in anticipation of a godsend or a pat on the head. Isn't it the same thing? On the back porch, we say please and thank you and smile with our best Sunday smiles. On the back porch, the wait is long, so we tell stories to pass the time, but sometimes the stories slip out, slither out to meet truth halfway in a language that is of the other land. Dualism, they say. 
is a mockery of the back porch offering we have been given. And in those moments, we do what we do best. We lower our heads and repent, reduce our unraveling to a silhouette of a model minority. And we know better than to complain when we have secured a spot on the back porch as human amid immigrants, man amid the others, the back porch is humid, but we are good at tolerating at swallowing the heat like a memoir. We pride ourselves on our hopeful, so we diminish the back porch to only a rest stop. We name the house a higher calling we have not yet earned the halos for, but how euphemistic to believe that the same gatekeepers who locked us out would allow our hands to thumb the edges of this shimmering neighborhood, how naive to gorge ourselves on dreams about penning a place in the house for us, because for us, there was never a house. For us, they were never waiting. For us, they are still awake and watching through the window sills and they smile. They tell us that it is still not enough. They tell us that it is easier for a camel to make it through the eye of a needle than for someone to make it through the back door, convince us that we do not want it enough. Convince us that the back porch has always been our home. Thank you. Wow, the first time, but not the last time, I promise you that. You're amazing. Thank you so much for your words. Our next reader is Lisa Lim, who is a friend. Um, not that long ago, we spent quite a bit of a day talking to one another over the internet and kind of keeping each other grounded. And I'm enormously grateful both to Lisa's work and uh, her heart. So without further ado, Lisa. Oh, thank you for the introduction, Kim. Yes, I remember that day. Um, still trying to keep ourselves grounded, aren't we? Um, this is such an honor. And I would like to start with a land acknowledgement that I reside on the land of Coast Miwok Tribal Nation. And I celebrate the active work of their descendants to preserve and nourish their indigenous identity. Um, I'm an immigrant from Malaysia, and so I would like to start with a piece that I wrote called The Saga Tree. In a landmass called Eurasia, there is a trading route. On that busy route, traders butter anything from handmade to handpicked produce. One particular seed, scarlet, shiny, small, has a significant cultural and medicinal property throughout the land. Because of the consistent and precise weight of the seed, traders use them as a standard unit of measurement for gemstones. Four of these little scarlet seeds equal to one carat, the same unit that we use to weigh diamonds today. In Malay, these red scarlet seeds are called saga. They grow in pods like peas. In school, we used to play them with a game called chongkak, better known in English as mankala. When I learned the decimal number system in primary school, we used two types of seeds to represent tens and ones. The larger seed, the rubber seed, is a black, and brown seed with black stripes that look like a small little watermelon. They represent tens. The small little red saga seed represent ones. Once I stole one and brought home and showed my mom. Mom explained to me that in Chinese, they are called lovesick, lovesick beans because separated lovers would promise each other to meet under the saga tree, inshallah. So how do I share the saga of these lovesick beans? 
since the saga tree is also known as the Circassian tree. Perhaps I should start with the saga of Circassia to unforget the taste of farewells, to unforget the blooms weathering exhaustion in spring. When hurricanes howl, unforgiving laments to let go, let go, and let go some more. To let go until a gentle breeze whispers unforgettable echoes to hold on, hold on and hold on to shadows, glints of footprints left in the long and lone alley until they dissipate into the wan moonlight to give way to another dawn, another swing in an open playground abandoned. Sagas full of plucked pods in spring, unforget forlorn leaves detached from their twigs, unforget their tears, unforget their smiles, unforget lovers saunters in the rain, unforget their embraces in the wind, unforget their transgressions to shape the fruit of our innocence. And the second piece is called Becoming American. Um, I wrote this piece inspired from um, a couple of movies, particularly Aliens <laughs> and some science fiction. But it's also kind of like a encompassing of my um, experience as an immigrant citizen. So this piece is called Becoming American. I owe you and I an explanation. I'm sorry for my silence for I am a foreign citizen. Born from my visa, I am a numbered alien. I am the suspicious visitor dressed in human skin who exterminate rat infestations by ingesting them. The red eye cyborg who, after iterations of manufacturing cycles, have become more productive in doing man's bidding. The xenomorph the drooling monster with razor sharp teeth who made Ellen Ripley a darling. I could swallow your babies and impregnate your wives or husbands, if you wish. Don't you worry what lies between my legs for I guarantee results with a lick of my tongue. I slither into your institutions fresh off the borders via land, air, and sea, distinguished as a cunning homo economicus, an overzealous money-grabbing opportunist who steal your jobs and your men, gold digger pretending to be impoverished because of my lack of foresight, uneducated due to my laziness. I am a brown bag made of paper, using bark peeled off from mother, earth beaten to a pulp, soaked in flash floods of monsoon rain until I yield to the torrid haze. All this while being held down by weights that transform my bones into thin sheets of fractured forest only to be glued back together by workers making pennies in a man-made environment. Squeezed into 10 standard boxes stacked above one another, compressing other bags, leaving a sentence of servitude. I have a hollow mouth 
that holds recyclable manufactured content. My handles evolve like tongues tied to tags. Every mistake tears. Who I really am is an analog relic. One increment of Ohm's law, a spark of electrical voltage whose potential difference depend on the reciprocity between resistance and currency. A decapsulated stateful transmission protocol, body of congruence electrons networked over generations and borders to recover reliable connections through my limited edition alien days. The token ring by creators of disinformation and misinformation, vibrating harmonic progressions to your melodic tones, suspending inversions to your minor rests and major lifts. I play in your stadiums and museums and schools and places of worship, deployments and redeployments, holiday celebrations and warriors' funerals. I am here to enhance your, our unfinished symphony. I'm sorry for my silence for I am becoming American. Thank you. You always leave me almost breathless with your words. Thank you so much. Our next reader is um, Melinda Luisa de Jesus, who, let's see, we've had some fun moments. I'm trying to think of one that's suitable for common consumption. We, we have... Uh, <laughs> We are nerds together. We have an entirely different connection. <laughs> also, she was my boss for a while. Um, what else? We've performed together more than once. Um, and she's just brilliant. Um, but, you know, another big, big nerd. So anyway, <laughs> please welcome in the best possible way. You know that that's a compliment coming from me. <laughs> She teaches one of the most popular classes at uh, California College of the Arts um, on monsters. <laughs> what else to say about you? Anyway, just welcoming you here, and I can't wait to hear your voice, lady. Thank you for being here. <laughs> Thank you, Kim. We miss you at CCA. It's just amazing to think of myself being your boss. Anyway, <laughs> I really just appreciate how folks made this space tonight. Um, I really needed to be here with y'all. Um, there's just been so much going on, but March was very difficult for me and I wrote a ton. So I wanna share three pieces that I wrote in response to the anti-Asian violence just of March, 2021. This first piece is called Bloodline. In memory of my foremothers and for the Atlanta Ates lost to racist violence. And I wrote this for um, OSA's Asian Pacific Islander Student Union. One, Felicidad Juanita Eloisa, my bloodline. Fierce Filipinas who resisted the occupation, survived the war, believed the American dream. Their tears, labor, sacrifice, audacious love conjured me upon this foreign soil. How can I tell them? Their sacrifice was moot. The American dream is just for white folks only. Two, six Asian women are dead, mom. What separates them from me, us? What good are my perfect English, my PhD, my work, my work, when all they see is expendable, alien, inscrutable other, something to wipe their feet on? How do we fight this war outside, within? I'm tired, so fucking tired. But like you, for you, Dail Sayo, I must push on. 
This next piece is called Contingent. A litany for my fellow Asian Americans who don't identify as BIPOC. Number one. Contingent acceptance is just that, contingent. Conditional upon white supremacy's whims and desires. Bahala na. Number two. Did you stand with BIPOC folks or did you pretend you're white, a law abiding model minority, a credit to the race? Did you turn away from their suffering thinking they're too loud, too pushy? Wonder why BIPOC folks don't see our pain and expect white saviors to intercede? Oh, they have, believe me, they're in our brains and in our inaction, defensiveness, disdain, fear, self-loathing. Don't you see? The white saviors keep killing us, all of us. Six this week, how many more next time? We're merely white adjacent until we're not. Foot soldiers in our own demise. Bahala na. Number three, we're contingent until we can see ourselves and those who struggle with, for, and like us. May Kapwa save us. Isong Bagsa. This last one is called Pantoum for Asians in America, March 2021. America, where are Asian folks allowed to be? That nurse was just waiting for her train. Lola was just on her way to mass. Grandpa was out on his morning walk. That nurse was just waiting for her train. Six aunties going about their normal day. Lola was just on her way to mass and grandma was just waiting for that bus. Six aunties going about their normal day. Lola was just on her way to mass and grandma was just waiting for that bus. America, when can Asian folks live free? And this is for Tiffany in San Jose, March 10th. 2021. Phil Makari, New York City, March 29th, 2021. Pak Ho, Oakland, March 12th, 2021. Sun Chung Park, Atlanta. Hyung Jung Grant, Atlanta. Sun Cha Kim, Atlanta. Yang A Yue, Atlanta. Xiao Zhe Tan, Atlanta. Dao Yu Feng, Atlanta, March 16th, 2021. And Xiao Zhe Zi, San Francisco, March 17th. 2021, and all victims of anti-Asian violence, Maki Baka. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, you blew me away there. I'm not often speechless. Our next, our next poet is Eileen Casanetto, who is the current poet laureate of San Mateo County and has done phenomenal work um, in a lot of different directions and in support of a lot of different communities and uh, uh, who I consider a good friend, Eileen. Thank you, Kim and Lauren for holding this space. Thank you all for joining us this evening. I'm Eileen Gassanetto, Poet Laureate of San Mateo County, Land of the Ohlone. I'll be reading three poems. The first one is about our collective stories as women. Legacy. To tell her story, you must know when to put courage in a matchbox and conceal it in a loaf of bread. You must learn how a message betokened deliverance when courage is simply a word someone wrote on a slip of paper and the sweet scent of bread could no longer sustain you. You must grasp your other hand with what grit remains, growing and unyielding. To tell her story, you must walk in her shoes. If forced out of your leased farmland, don't forget to bring rice if you can pack only what you can carry. And if your mother did not speak inside the bus with the windows covered with brown paper on the way to the barracks, it was only because she was praying that you would not be housed in the horse stall with the manure whitewashed over. And if you were, 
she was deciding what to do about the smell. To tell her story, you must remember the landscape from behind barbed wire fences. You must gaze at your body and know its history. Look beneath the tender ridged scars and see the bone protruding out of your right arm and hole the size of a football on your right thigh, wondering how the lights never went out. You must look at the image of your grandmother with the weight of rammed earth against what you survived. To tell her story, you must say a prayer not of sorrow, but of grace. You must loosen the earth, pick daffodils to the base of the stem, remember your roots and ordinary days, and the grit under your fingernails, the way your grandmother taught you. This next poem is in solidarity with the Black community because what hurts them also hurts us. Haint Blue. T to free yourself of the haint, you need to vanquish it. Paint your porch the color of water, which is power, with the might to scatter blue light to the green of sea water. But remember how heavy color can be, how shades of blue came from true indigo, which needed an abundance of water and limestone above the bedrock before it became a cash crop, which needed to be pounded and crushed and dusted with wood ash to make blue cakes, which was the currency of slavery. A bolt of cloth dyed indigo for one human body, but mixed with lime and some white mineral, it resembled water, which haints could not cross over. This last poem is for Dao Yo Feng, Xiao Che Tan, Hian Yong Grant, San Cha Kim, Sun Chung Park, and Yong A Yue. Dust. Sometimes we're like months and winds, shifting east of where home is. Sometimes we're like tea leaves, heavenly and unfurling in agony. This is how we shape the earth. Dust up the springs and autumns, see where it rained, which map bore our shade and which palace to place above us where our majesty raised a dust. Thank you for listening. Lauren, I believe we have a, um... A guest. Yes. To speak now. Yes. So, wow. Thank you so much, everyone who's read um, thus far. It is just truly an honor to experience your words tonight. In terms of a little bit of context about how this event has been able to come together, is in large part thanks to an organization called AWA, also known as the Asian American Women Artists Association. Um, I am currently a fellow with AWA in curating an exhibition called Political Inheritance that explores the tensions that have been inherited across generations within diasporic Asian and Pacific Islander communities that shape our relationships and um, very complex interactions with U.S. political systems and U.S. political action. That exhibition will be in person, um, but physically distanced and a window exhibition in summer of 2021. Um, but again, this event would not be possible without AWA. And so I'm going to pass the mic to Michelle, who is the president of the AWA board to share a little bit more about the organization, the background, and um, some of the work that they're currently doing today. So thank you so much, Michelle, for joining us. Thanks so much, Lauren. Hi, everyone. My name is Michelle. And as Lauren said, I'm with the Asian American Women Artists Association, and we are really proud to present this very timely and significant night of poetry. Uh, it's been incredibly moving so far. So I thank all the poets for um, sharing your work. Um, AWA's mission is to advance the visibility and recognition of Asian American women in the arts. Having a space for AAPI women artists to feel seen and celebrated is both a gift and a necessity. Um, some of the other programs we have going on include uh, Papadam, an exhibition created by our other emerging curators fellow, Kamardeep Singh, 
located at the I Hotel Mala Town Center on Kearney Street. And the show is closing this Sunday, April 18th. So don't wait to go see the show. And during AAPI Heritage Month in May, we will also be presenting our next exhibition at Soma Arts Cultural Center, Sewing Agency, Seeding the Future for Environmental Justice. Um, this is in partnership with API Cultural Center for their annual United States of Asian America Festival. We, enjoy, uh, we invite you to join us and subscribe to our newsletter to get more updates. If you're interested in learning more about AWA, joining as a member or want to support our mission, you can visit our website at aawaa.net, awa.net. Um, thanks again, Lauren, and all the poets, and Kim um, and Nisa. This has been um, a really great honor for us. Thank you so much, Michelle. Thank you, Lauren, for making the, connecting the circle up. Our next poet uh, is Christine No, who um, I most recently saw in a distant tea on my front porch with her delightful dog. Uh, I wasn't exaggerating when I said these poets are friends. It's one of the great privileges of having been the poet laureate of San Francisco that I get to know people I might not get to know otherwise, uh, who I automatically have something in common with. Uh, Christine's work changes my writing whenever I hear her write. I can't think of a bigger compliment to give somebody because I'm very set in my stubborn little writing ways. But her work is amazing, and, and I hope you mm -hmm. enjoy Christine No. Oh, wow. Uh, thank you so much for saying that. Um, no, I can't. There's people here. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, Kim and Lauren, for holding the space and for having me and allowing me to join this amazing lineup, you guys. I'm like, oh, and I got my COVID vaccine, like my second one earlier, and so I'm a little nauseous, so excuse me. How's that for an intro? Um, sweet. My first poem is called Prayer for the Season. I'm a woman abated, a city block upturned, Four alarm fire, tongue held in a cage match. I'm a phone call refused, an exceptional facade. It takes a village to raise a monster. I'm a whole village raised. Oh, executioner, show me how it got inside. Show me where the fire started. Show me where I lost my wallet, where rot began, where fester left a bloodbath. Whole auditorium spellbound, gasoline in the drain, head severed, all ventriloquists dragged and quartered, tongue evicted. Mumbled a tone deaf hosanna, dumbfounded, Lord save us, this world is open season. Whole intersections stopped at massacre and crosshair, the corners unaccounted for, bless our valiant failures. Late bloomers to the schoolyard, the sitting duck alone. This world is an open world. Lord, bless the prodigal arson, the self-appointed executioner, the vengeful, sullen queen. They come hunting. Glory their inheritance, pockets full of teeth and evidence. And Lord, bless the rest of us, the blissful useless. This world is open season. Easy targets split wide open wound, and won't you keep us helpless onlookers, our best intentions, our wrong hands, our rubber necks. Thank you. Um, so when, when I first heard about everything that happened in Georgia, um, I kind of had some trouble like engaging with it. And really the first kind of media thing that I saw out of that horrible week was um, the, uh, like a news clip about, I think an older, I think she was Chinese um, woman who was punched in the face while standing at a crosswalk. And like, I, I feel like the news portrayed it as like, whoa, she's so strong, she's 85 and she kicked his ass and she was still yelling at him. But when I saw it, like, I like all I saw was like this like terror and trauma on her face. And it just made me think about how like as women, you know, having to 
having to have that reflex at all of self-defense is a is it's not fair and it's very scary um and it made me think about my grandmother and my mother um so here we go my grandmother dreams in her dreams i am a child she is too i am her granddaughter she is mine this is her final masterpiece in her mind, I go to church with the suitors she's dreamt for me. Their slick hair combed neat, their black suits. In her mind, we are not beholden to time. Her love is alive and she hasn't gone mad for another 40 years. In her dreams, my grandmother is a small girl annexed, a woman like me, a half-finished country. She is beside herself and her kids at the playground with her sisters, their happy shrieks. Her eyes are dark and sharp, not milky gray, and she remembers each detail, weaves the world a story as she has taught me to do. She remembers how long her braids, how bent her spine, how picked over the bodies alongside the road, the wind of an air raid, her eyes closed tight, just her hands and God to guide her, how the heart can be halved by a fence, a demarcation, how a mother knows the outline of her still dead son, how each passing decade, the world burns indiscriminate, hotter, and her body shrinks less a shield. How her past is root rootless, ruthless. How she worries for her grandchildren and their girl children and girl children. In her dreams, there is time and place and reason. There, my grandmother is born again, an ancestor, an amalgamation of all lives lived, woman after woman, each wondering when she stopped having the answers, when, when time stopped traveling, when she stopped believing that things would work out in the end. Thank you. And um, should we call it? There was a phone. Um, I want to read two more pieces. Uh, one is um, called Red Name. Um, red name. Mother named me soon, obedient daughter, faithful dog, soft, pink, my father's humid lap, did not speak, did not mouth, dead thing, alone, unhinged jaw, gnawed each piece, crowned myself, sunrise, buried, prayed, night, torn open, worn, unholy spine, fashioned gloves, tongue tied meat from nail, swallowed, buried, prayed, exhumed my red name. Bone adorned, rubied string, aubergine globule. My red name enrages my mother. My red name refuses my father. Soon my red name burns, avert my red name sees, hunts, jaw dangling, devoured many men, prayed pink, earned my red name finally. Dinner, daughter, father, viscous, mother, master, soon, son, son soon soon gone thank you um and this third piece is um one of the first poems that i, I write a lot about myself because i'm christian and um this is uh one of the poems the first poems really that i wrote and i shared here in the Bay Area, and I figured it was kind of appropriate. So this one's called Groundling. It's in three parts. Um, one, I hold anger like my mother, wedged between shoulder and spine where wings should have sprouted, but didn't. Where the nubs grew over skin and feather, left her back hunched, her lips pursed, her gaze flitting elsewhere, elsewhere, but sky. I hold it like disrupted prayer, two palms clenched, or an unfinished poem, impatient, pacing. I hold anger like my mother who did not have poetry, who felt the itch of becoming, plucked each new feather and stuck around, filled the emptiness with other beasts. 
anger like my mother, who did not have poetry, no words to tell me why. Two. Mother, my wings are heavy with beasts I have carried, as I have seen you do. I learn by sight and feel, and like you, I am deaf to caution. Mother, I have discovered a word for those who fly away, wisdom and hope for those who stay. Three, my daughter will be born a wingless thing, like her mother, like mine. I wonder if hers will sprout at all, if she will fly, or if woman after woman, the body has forgotten how. Groundling, do not discard your wings. Hope alone will not provide. But should they never come, do not stick around and place your anger between blade and bone. Do not shoulder the empty beast and stay. My groundling, remember the house of your own embrace. Remember your two feet and walk. Thank you so much. Thank you, Christine. <sighs> You can't tell me I didn't warn you about all of these poets so far. You just, I will not be responsible for that. Our next poet is Clara Sue. And I have two fabulous stories about Clara Sue. And I think she doesn't like one of them. So I'm going to roll the dice and decide which one to share. But I will also say that I have never spent um, a sad or unfulfilled moment in her company. Um, our partners played baseball together and mine came home with his undies in a bit of a bunch and said, I was playing baseball with this guy who says that his partner is the best poet in San Francisco. And I said, really, who is that? And he said, oh, well, Clara Sue. And I said, that is entirely possible. So on that note, <laughs> welcome, please, Clara Sue. Kim, <laughs> that story is too much. Thank you so much for having me here and Lauren too. And I'd like to celebrate the resiliency of women and immigrants by sharing with you my meeting with the last Chinese opera singer in Havana, Cuba. That was in 2018. We're gonna begin with La Havana Vieja. The old woman that is the old town set has pink on her cheeks and rhythm in her eyes. She tastes like lobster stewed in warm spices and she cooks congri, white rice soaked in bean ink, puffs a cohiba and sells dolls. The old man in the old town can't keep up with her except for the village idiot. He dances every dance in front of every band. He knows all the two of us drivers because they ask him to keep his voice down and don't stick your hand inside the bus window for pesos. They give him a little something sweet enough to occupy him until the next time. The old town that is the old woman melts the clock on the floor of Plaza Vieja, turning it into Plaza Nueva. And the day the old woman grows even older they might call her by the right name again. We Fredo Lamb and Victor Hugo are neighbors walking to La Casa de Poesia. Gabriel Garcia Marquez greets them in the garden. They listen to Lipo's moon and wonder about the frost on the ground, a curious joke for a Césaire. In a bar, Hemingway drinks with the crowd. They keep coming, whirling in front of La Floridita. Just a stone throw away, Castro and Che dine in a little back room. The waitress says they call her China. The barrio's not far from here, she says, but only a handful of them 
are there now. Karidan Amaran, the last Chinese opera singer in Havana. People are used to seeing this old woman moving among them, gracious, speaking in Cantonese without a drop of Chinese blood. Yet she is the last of her kind, donned with a phoenix crown and long flowing sleeves, singing without accompaniment. Instruments were confiscated after the revolution. Life is defined as before and after. 20,000 Chinese dwindling down to less than 20 who can still speak Seyap, the village language of South China. In an upstairs room, the image of Guan Gong and his three brothers, all revolutionary heroes of another time. Honor was the code, even though not born at the same time, but wish to die together. It was not to be. Destiny is never dictated by man's wish. So the dimming torch is carried by a woman whose stepfather was a Chinese man immersed in the art of opera. In the heyday, there were four theaters in Havana and she was the princess, the butterfly lover, the woman warrior, the white snake spirit. Darling, this loose curled redhead must have stolen the hearts of thousands. Her fingers still extend like an orchid flower and her high pitched voice soars above the woodblock and cymbals now played by her dark skinned grandchildren. She is happy to receive an embroidered pink silk jacket. She won't take it off even in the heat. The Longgong Association is lively with visitors from San Francisco. Many Chinese faces, many Cuban faces, many languages, many gestures, too many, too many smiles and laughter. The village swells. She holds my hand and together we sing. Thank you. Wow. Wow. Can I just suggest to everybody who can do this as we start opening up and it becomes possible again, Clarion um, Center does the most amazing performances and uh, definitely if you can manage to make it to one, do that. Thank you so much, Clara. Um, our next reader is Kimi Sugioka, who is the current Poet Laureate of Alameda. Um, I feel like Kimi and I have known each other a lot longer than we actually have, uh, because we have this city in common in a really big way. And so without further ado, I think she's got her own following and probably doesn't need a lot of flowery words from me. But if you don't know her work, definitely seek it out. Amazing poet. Welcome, Kimi Sugioka. 
Thank you, Kim. Thank you. I'm grateful to you. I'm grateful to Lauren um, for holding this reading. And I am just incredibly moved by all the words that I've heard by all the poets. Um, I want to do three things. This is an older poem, but it's about my family, my Japanese family, not my Scots Irish family, my Japanese family. Ancestral Sestina. My grandmother was grown in Matsuyama Castle. She played the koto, never learned to cook, was a plum blossom child plucked from a young tree to marry her sister's widowed husband in America. She grew 10 children in America, in California, where her home was his castle, watched him graft plum branches to an apricot tree, reminded of the koto she played as a child when she wasn't learning to cook. Her daughters learned to cook hamburgers and tsukemono, American names for every child. At times, she grew distant in the hum of her mind castle, cried for her koto, clung to her plum tree. Twice felled from her tree, plum rendered with cooking, she surrendered the strains of her koto to foreclosure by the Bank of America. She burned Matsuyama photos of her rice paper castle, escaped to Colorado as the camps claimed her children. Roosevelt's imprisoned epicanthic-eyed children grew tough and cordial as manzanita trees grew rock gardens around barren barrack castles, determined to cook the meatless bones tossed off by America without snapping the back of the koto. I have never held a koto. I'm not a child of assimilated America. I'm the apricot branch of the plum tree, an ambivalent cook in a negligent castle. I imagine the poignant strain of a koto tuned to the ear of a paper-walled castle, a petulant child in need of a cook who wanted a plum tree, who planted a plum tree in the Salinas Valley. Got kind of emotional there because I was remembering um, my father telling me about when they left Hollister. And they burned all the photos and they shot the dog. And I have so little left of them, so little. So anyway, um, I've written this about what's been happening lately. I thought that you'd be able to tell us apart by now. I thought that you liked my long hair and winning smile. I thought that you considered our teriyaki and sashimi a delicacy. I thought that you found the golden tones of our skin attractive. I thought that you had forgotten about us, that we had become invisible. I thought that you knew that all of this land was stolen. I thought that we had been here for so long that you stopped perceiving us as foreign. I thought that you appreciated how hard we have worked to be here. I thought that I might live here afraid for my life, just like everybody else, without being specifically targeted. I thought we had paid our dues when we worked on and died by the thousands on your railroads, when you dropped napalm and Agent Orange on our villages, when you threw us in prison for our ancestry, when you redlined your districts to keep us out, when you refused us citizenship, when you bombed us in Vietnam, Japan, Korea, Lebanon, Laos, Cambodia, the Philippines, I thought we were just another set of immigrants with our elders allowed to walk unmolested through the streets of their neighborhoods to shop for dinner, go to church, visit relatives, or just walk. I was wrong. And the last piece I wrote after um, after um, George Floyd was murdered, and it just seems to keep coming back to me. 
Why would anybody want to watch somebody die? Why? Some things are not meant to be burned into your mind. Mind. We cannot erase them no matter how hard we try. Try. They traumatize and haunt us until the day we die die a curriculum for fools is what we learned in school fools now is the time to exhume all the skeletons of truth truth remove every arrow and tend to every wound wound Repair and restitution are the tools that we can use. Use. The blood of the innocent saturates this country. Country. This is our inheritance, whether or not we believe. Believe. This is our inheritance, whether or not we believe believe this is our inheritance no matter how what we believe believe thank you very much thank you thank you kimmy um our last poet is uh jara deng and uh i had asked that a poem be sent to me and I've got to say you guys are in for it and uh, I'm so glad you're here Jira. take it away um, thank you so much um, I'm very grateful for uh, the San Francisco Public Library for hosting this event and also to all the other amazing poets who just read um, Asian American literature is so rich and so diverse. And to be a part of these amazing like, people and community is always a blessing every day. Um, so um, my poems um, are pretty short, so I wanted to read three. Um, it has honestly been a very, very difficult year. And it's been a very difficult month. Um, and at this time, like I was struggling to find the words to kind of express what I've been feeling. And it was just like so hard because all of these emotions had like built up and I was like, ah, <laughs> how do I get everything onto the page? What if words are not enough? Um, so that's what I wanted to um, share with people today. Um, the first the first poem I wanted to read for you all is kind of an angry poem, and hopefully, though, as I read the next um, two poems, then it leaves you with a little bit of encouragement. Um, the first poem is uh, a contrapuntal, um, which can be read three ways, but I'll just be reading it one one way <laughs> for the sake of time. And the second half of the poem is a whitewashing or an erasure of the first part of the poem. Thanks, but the role of white girl is already taken. White girl says my poetry is too specific. Translation, can't relate writing that doesn't center me. White girl thinks she'll save my culture from oblivion, wants to educate, wants to politicize her fetish. I can't trace my lineage, broken promises, my stolen tongue. White girl tells my sister and me to be careful on election night as people of color, living post internment, post exclusion, alien at home. White girl can't own up to publishing a racist. Of course I write, Apology, a blood debt to my people, I'm sorry. White girl on Bumble puts hashtag BLM in her profile like it's a personality trait. 
IG activist, Twitter rager, don't know how to hold my grief and loss. White girl says I'm overreacting, tells me to look at myself instead of criticizing. Truth is, all day, how many, I think, how many knees are next considered a mistake, a slip up, an oversight. White girl expresses surprise on national television when a trigger happy white supremacist storms the Capitol. White thinks my culture, my lineage of color, alien. A racist apology, I don't know how to hold. Look at my truth, all day a girl storms. This second poem is called Object Permanence. And um, I was thinking a lot about what it means to be at the intersection of being Asian American and also being queer. And um, it feels like, you know, you are there physically present, but nobody is looking at you until suddenly everybody is looking at you. And sometimes it's so much. And I don't even know how to walk into certain spaces sometimes when it's like, I feel like there are expectations or maybe a lack of expectations, right? Object permanence. When I reach, it just escapes me. Falling in perpetuity between the precipice of home and foreign oceans. When I walk into a room, how do I name myself? the celestial being, a flashing beacon in the night, the stalwart embrace, a rooted tree knotted around the eroded cliff side, a shift in weight and the sea rises, the mountains fall. Such things hold the bias, a stake in the future. How long has it been since someone has touched me? Caress the flat planes of my face, kiss the almonds of my eyes, crawl under the yellow flush of my skin. Will you have me as strong-willed and unbending as others prefer where I am always lost, never found? I'm begging you not to look away. I'm on my knees interceding to the gods of tomorrow, end of sorrow, abolish peril, end of want, abolish fruit and labor. My siblings and I meet, touching as cherubim before our reflection and bless that image fully. Um, and this last one, um, I wrote it for <laughs> actually in submission to have a chance to share this as like um, a a performance poem with a nonprofit, and I haven't heard back from them yet, but I was just struggling so hard to write this poem because I was just crying a lot and struggling to find the words. But um, at the end of it, I think I found a lot of like resonance and I hope that closing with this poem it leaves people um, feeling uplifted tonight. This body is not a virus after Fatima Aisha. I'm dreaming of new futures where I claim the women who work the massage parlors, the fathers and mothers who leave behind continents then pass down their languages to their children. I'm blessing us gays, theys, and bays who kiss in open streets or shuttered behind closed doors. I'm thanking my fight over the Czech aunties and uncles who drop off secondhand clothes and homegrown fruit. I call my people borderless. When friends fly away and green cards fail to grow on trees, I'm here for the tragedy. When another life is taken and when no metaphors can cut the loss, I pray for the words to hold us all. I pray that words will never be enough. My mouth has been the exit wound of my family tree. I'm asking you to make it your altar an offering of love and laughter to tide us through the storm and calm. The revolution, in our the revolution in our hearts demands our pause, stop dredging up those kingdoms and let your joy do the work. Um, thank you again. <laughs>
Thank you. <laughs> well, this was amazing for me. I think it was probably amazing for other people. I'm going to turn it over for last words to Lauren. Lauren. Wow. Um, plus one to everything that Kim just said. I feel like I've, I've laughed. I have cried. I have had emotions that I don't even have words for. Um, thank you so much to the incredible poets, to Clara, to Kimmy, to um, <laughs> to Lisa, to Eileen, to Christine, to Anouk, to Melinda, and Michelle um, from AWA for all sharing, and especially to the San Francisco Public Library for making this space possible. Um, it is poetry events like this that I think affirm for me um, how much poetry not only is supportive of creating an avenue for us to speak our truths, but also to support healing and sometimes find the words thanks to another person expressing them. So thank you so much. Um, we will share, share once again in the chat a list of resources to get um, involved if you're curious and feeling motivated and fueled to take some of this energy and channel it um, in service of the community and service of this moment. But thank you, deep gratitude to Kim also for facilitating this opportunity and making this happen. Um, and so much gratitude. We know there are many places you could spend your Friday evening. So thank you for spending it with us. I seem to be back up on the screen. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure why, except to thank the audience. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anissa. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, all the poets again. Yes, sorry. Spotlight chaos. <laughs> uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, the link that I just put in the chat box one more time coming in for the resources. And you can watch this event again on YouTube, along with many other great events that we've hosted here. And thank you for joining us for this Friday night. And all of that link that I just put in, all of the poets links are in there so you can find them. And poets, find me. <laughs> Let's do some events. All right, friends, thank you all and have a wonderful night. And thank you for being so powerful and being here tonight. Thank you so much. Be well. <laughs>